Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first cigarette with premium quality throughout in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. You get a call that a 72-year-old man has been murdered. His invalid wife has been brutally beaten. There's no lead to the assailants. Your job, get him. When you're asked to try a cigarette, you want to know, and you ought to know, what that cigarette is meant to people who smoke it and who smoke it all the time. For almost a year now, a medical specialist has given a group of Chesterfield smokers thorough examinations every two months. He reports no adverse effects to their noses, their throats, or sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. More and more men and women all over the country are finding out every day that Chesterfield is best for them. Enjoy your smoking. Try Chesterfields today. You'll find Chesterfield much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, August 12th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 8, 12 a.m. when we got to 8469 North Brighton Avenue. The front door. Yes? Mrs. Hurley? Yes, who are you? Police officers. It's my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Oh, well, it's about time you got here. Yes, ma'am. I wonder if we could see Mrs. Stone. I don't think so. The ambulance man's with her now, giving her some kind of pill, something to calm her down. Lord knows the poor thing certainly needs something. Yes, ma'am. We'd like to see her, please. Like I said, I don't know if you can. I'll have to ask the ambulance man. Well, I'm sure it's all right, ma'am, if you just let us talk to the attendant. You just wait here. I'll talk to him. Now, look, I don't like to be rude, ma'am, but this is a murder investigation. If you'll open the door, please. How do I know you're what you say you are? How do I know you're cops? Well, here's our identification. Well, looks enough like you, I guess. All right, come on. Thank you. Where is Mrs. Stone? Back there, in the back bedroom. I'll check with the attendant, Jack. Right, Frank. I wonder if you could tell us what you know about this, Mrs. Hurley. You just bet I can. You just bet. That poor woman back there. She's lying at death's door because you didn't do your job, you know that? Ma'am? At death's door. It's your job to see that things like this don't happen. That's what you're paid for. And look, just look. Her poor husband dead and herself all beaten. Poor thing. I just don't understand what the world's coming to when things like this can happen. Well, first, ma'am, there was no way we could stop this. I think you understand that. We're trying to clean it up now. We're going to need your help to do it. Now, if you just tell me what happened, please. Yeah, that's what you say. I know different. All right, Mrs. Hurley. The faster we can get started on this thing, the better chance we have of getting the people responsible for it. I suppose so. Well, what do you want to know? Well, if you'd please start at the beginning and tell me what you know about it. Yeah. Well, it started this morning. About 7 or 7.15, I think. I heard this noise at the back door, kind of a scratching kind of noise. And a moan, a little tiny moan. Sounded like it was way off, kind of uh, in the distance. Yes, ma'am. First, I wasn't sure that I wasn't dreaming the whole thing. You know how it is when you're awakened out of a sound sleep. Yes, I understand. Well, it was like that. It took me about ten minutes before I knew that there really was something there. Well, I got up and went to the door. And that's when I found her, right there at the back door, kind of laying on the porch. I could see right away that someone had beaten her. That's when I called the ambulance. And then she told me about how her husband had been killed, and then I called you. The other car, the one with the men in uniform, come out. Mm -hmm. They looked around, and then they went over to the house. And that'd be the Stones' house? That's right, next door. I see. How about it, Frank? Well, it's pretty bad, Joe. They're treating her now. Can we see her? Only well, the attendant says it'll be all right for a couple of minutes. Not much more than that. They're going to take her to Georgia Street. Okay. 
He said he'd let us know and we could talk to her. All right, fine. Did she tell you what happened, Mrs. Hurley, anything at all? Just that there was two men. They come in and beat up on her, killed her husband. That was enough. One look at her and I could tell she was hurt bad. And her an invalid. I just don't understand how anybody in their right mind could do a thing like this. I just don't understand it. Yes, ma'am. Now, you say that she's an invalid, is that right? Yes, they were involved in an auto accident a couple of years ago. Some drunk ran right into them, smashed the car all up, laid Mr. Stone up for a couple of months, and put Patricia in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Can't walk at all. She crawled over here. Don't know how she did it. It's great courage. Yes, ma'am. Did you hear anything at all last night? Any disturbances? Not a thing. What you told not me? a thing. Went to bed about ten. Slept like a rock. Didn't hear a thing until this morning. That was about seven, seven fifteen, maybe. Like I said, nope. I didn't hear a thing. Well, do you know if there was anyone that the Stones were afraid of? Anyone who might have done a thing like this? Nope. I can't think of a soul. How about money, ma'am? Did Mister Stone keep large sums of money around the house? Well, now I don't know. He might have. Joe. Well, yeah, Hal. You want to see her now? Yeah, come on, Frank. All right. You gonna want to talk to me some more? Yes, ma'am. We'll be back. <laughs> Mrs. Stone. <laughs> Mrs. Stone. Yes. Who is it? Police officers, ma'am. We know you don't feel well, but there are a few questions we'd like to ask, if you don't mind. You got the men yet? The ones who did this. No, ma'am, not yet. I tried to tell them. I tried. They just wouldn't listen. Ma'am. I told them to take whatever they wanted and leave us alone. Just leave us alone. I tried to tell them. They wouldn't listen. They killed Henry. They tried to kill me. Do you know who they were, Mrs. Stone? What? I say, do you know who they were? The men who did this, do you know who they were? Had you ever seen them before? No, I don't think so. It was dark. Then I heard them argue with Henry. I tried to get up. I tried to help him, but I couldn't. I screamed, but they didn't pay attention. Then they killed him. Ma'am, can you describe them for us? Tell us how tall they were, how they were dressed, maybe? They didn't know that I was there. Then they came into my room, and they said they'd kill the other one, so they might as well kill me, too. I tried to tell them to go away, but they wouldn't listen. They just hit me and hit me and hit me. There was anything I could do. Did they drive a car, ma'am? Is there anything you can tell us that might help us in identifying them? Did one of them use a name, maybe? They locked me in the closet. They put that pillow over my head. I don't know why. I told them they could take what they wanted. Take it or they just leave us alone. But they didn't. They killed Henry. They tried to kill me. All right, Mrs. Stone. Everything's going to be all right here. Don't worry now. Just try and get some rest. It doesn't matter much now. Isn't anything that matters anymore. Nothing now that they killed Henry. All right, ma'am. Please try not to get upset. Joe. Yeah. Better get her downtown. Well, how's it look for her, Hal? What are her chances? Depends. Yeah. How hard she wants to try. <laughs> Eight forty-six a.m. The ambulance removed Mrs. Stone to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. We put in a call to the crime lab, and then we talked to the neighbor, Mrs. Hurley. She could add little to what she'd already told us. She said that she'd heard no loud noises during the night, and that she'd seen no one in the neighborhood acting suspicious. She told us, however, that Mr. Stone was known to have kept large sums of money in the house. She went on to say that he made no attempt to hide his distrust of banks, and that he had often said that all of his money was on the premises. Nine o two a.m. Frank and I went next door to the Stone home. The crime lab and latent fingerprint crews had arrived and were going over the place for physical evidence. We talked to Ray Pinker of the crime lab. This is how they got in. Yeah, I tore the screen, huh? Must have done it with their hands. Couldn't find any tool marks. You figured the door was open then, huh, Ray? Yeah, it looks that way. One of those old-fashioned locks, no indication that they forced it. Mm -hmm. Did you find anything else? Take a look back here in the closet. Mm -hmm. well, they sure tore the place up, didn't they? Yeah, went through everything. Even took the pictures off the walls. Yeah. Ripped up the bedding. There isn't a drawer they didn't go through. Any prints at all? Bergman's checking it. Haven't found anything yet that I know of. Pretty bad. Here. Look at the mattress on the husband's bed. Hmm. Tore it all up. Stuffing scattered around the room. Looks like a tornado went through the place. The closet's back here. Mm -hmm. This was Mrs. Stone's room. You can see where they dragged her. Must have hit her the first time about here, and then they dragged her over to this closet, dropped her in here. Mm -hmm. 
and see where she stacked those suitcases up there to pull herself out the window. I don't know how she did it. Bad off as she was. Looks like robbery was the motive then, huh, Ray? Can't agree with that, Joe. Why? Come on back in Stone's room. We found the murder weapon. Checked around. It looks like they picked him up in the backyard. Here, take a look. A couple of wooden clubs. Looks like they came from a walnut tree just outside the back door. Kind of blows the robbery angle. Yeah. They were ready to kill the stones when they came in. <laughs> a.m. The crime lab finished their investigation of the house. The backyard and the surrounding ground were gone over. In the soft earth at the foot of one of the walnut trees, a pair of footprints was found and plaster casts were made of them. On the lower limbs of the trees, we found the place where the two clubs could have been taken. The rest of the yard in the immediate vicinity were combed, but we found nothing. 12.15 p.m. Frank put in a call to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. They told him that Mrs. Stone had been given emergency treatment and then had been removed to the county hospital. Her condition was listed as critical. They said that it would be some time before we'd be able to talk to her. 1.30 p.m. We began to canvass the neighborhood. From the people in the surrounding houses, we found that Mr. Stone had retired from the wholesale grocery business about 10 years ago. He devoted himself to the cultivation of prize roses and the care of Mrs. Stone. The neighbors told us that the Stones were quiet and that they seldom entertained. 3.15 p.m., we went back to talk to Mrs. Hurley. I knew you'd be back. Ma'am? I knew you'd come back to talk to me again. Could have told you a lot, but I thought I'd just let you try and find out for yourself. Didn't do too well, did you, hmm? Did you? I don't think I understand, Miss Hurley. Simple. Anything you want to know about this neighborhood, you come to the source. That's me. Anybody knows what's going on here, I do. Yeah, well, if you had information that you thought we should have had, why didn't you tell us before, ma'am? I didn't want to. Ma'am? I said I didn't want to. I still say that you were responsible for this whole thing, done your job, and it wouldn't have happened. Oh, I still haven't forgot. Oh, no, sir. Now, look, Miss Hurley, this is a murder investigation. I've told you that before. A man has been killed, a woman's been badly beaten. We're going to need all the cooperation from you that we can get. I'm ready now. What? I'll cooperate. I'll tell you what you want to know. All right, Miss Hurley. First, do you have any idea who might have done this? You just bet I have. Who, ma'am? Their boy. Only one that's mean enough to do it. Only one. Their boy? Sure. Herman Jr., he's the one. You just bet. Why do you say that? Because I know that's why. Mean kid. Always had trouble with him. Because the only trouble ever was between Patricia and me. Troublemaker. That's what he was. Pure and simple. A troublemaker. How old is this boy, Miss Hurley? 36. A real monster. You know where the boy is now? No, and I'm not interested. Happiest day of my life when he moved out of the house. Oh, he and I used to get in some arguments. Little brat. Stand there and think he was so big. Finally, Mr. Stone saw it. Told him to get out. Moved right out of the house, bag and parcel, right out. You mean that Mr. Stone and the boy had arguments? See? That's what I mean. No wonder people don't cooperate with you. I beg your pardon? I say something, then you ask me if I mean it. Of course I mean it. I wouldn't say it otherwise. Like people who ask, what time is it? You tell them, and then they ask if you're sure. If they don't want to believe you, why do they ask you in the first place? Yes, ma'am. Were you there at the time, ma'am? No. No, I wasn't. It was a warm night. Just a couple of months ago, all the windows was open, and I just couldn't help seeing into their house. You know, houses being so close together, you can understand it. Yes, ma'am, we can understand. I don't like the way you said that, young man. Well, I didn't mean anything by it, Mrs. Hurley. Oh, well, I suppose not. But I don't want you to get the idea that I'm the nosy type. Oh, no, ma'am, not at all. Well, anyway... Mr. Stone told Herman to get his things and get out. Right out. That night. Uh-huh. Well, did the boy leave that night? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Went right into his room and packed. Said he'd never come back. That he didn't want anything more to do with the old man. Mm-hmm. And his father said that was the way he wanted it. He was going to cut him out of his will. Well, you can just believe that's when the trouble really started. Well, now, where was Mrs. Stone all this time? Well, she was in her room, but she'd come out. Wheeled herself right out told them to stop this foolishness. She always was kind of pampering the boy. I think myself, that's what caused him to be like he was. You know, tied to his mother's apron strings all the time. Yes, ma'am. That's when Herman said that about doing something. Said that the old man was senile. Said that he was crazy. And that the money was his, and he was going to see that he got it. Mm-hmm. Said he meant to have it if he had to kill somebody. 4.10 p.m. 
We got the full name and description of the stone boy from Mrs. Hurley. We went back to the office and ran the name through R&I. We found a Herman Stone Jr. with a record listing three arrests on charges of 4127A LAMC. We checked out his last known address, a hotel on South Hill, and found that he'd moved several weeks before. The manager gave us a forwarding address, and at 6.10 p.m., Frank and I drove out to see him. It was a large apartment hotel on Wilshire Boulevard. We talked to the desk clerk. Sure, I know Herman. Nice guy. Once in a while, it gets a little loud, but most of the time, he's a real nice guy. Is he here now? I don't think so. Let me look. Ah, uh, Key's here. I think I saw him go out about an hour ago. He wasn't feeling too well. Bad hangover. Any idea where he might be? No, like I said, I didn't talk to him. Just saw him go out. You know what he does for a living? Herman? Yes, sir. I don't think he does nothing. Plays the horses a little bit. Picks up a buck that way. Good player. Sure knows the dogs. Giving me a couple of tips. Didn't do any good. He sure does all right. Made a real killing yesterday. Must have hit it for about four or five thousand. That right? Yeah. Showed me the money this morning. Real big roll. At least four or five grand. Tips he gave me never did that good. You got any idea where he was last night? So what's this all about anyway? Herm done something? Well, it'd be better if we talked to him. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess you guys know what you're doing, huh? Well, yes, sir. He asked me if I knew what he was doing last night? Uh-huh. I sure do. He really tied one on. Of course, with his luck, I don't wonder. Really tied one on. Sir? Loaded. He got in here. He had a bottle. So you won't say anything about this to the management, will you? No, sir, we won't. Couldn't have that happen. They don't approve of drinking while I'm on duty. You understand, kind of stuffy, but that's the way they look at it. Uh-huh. Like I said, old Herm rolls in here, and he's got this bottle. He asked me to have one with him. Well, I don't like to get him sore, so I do. And we have a couple of more. Old Herm, that boy can really put it away. Yes, sir. What time was that? Well, let's see. I guess about 7, maybe 7.15. Mm-hmm. Did he go out after that? Sure didn't. Killed the bottle, and then he passed right out, cold. Slept there on that couch. Uh-huh. No, sir. Old Herm didn't go anyplace. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is the first cigarette to offer smokers premium quality in both regular and king size. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king-size cigarette. Chesterfield is first to name all its ingredients, ingredients that make the best possible smoke. And Chesterfield gives you this scientific report. No adverse effects to the nose and throat of a group smoking only Chesterfields. So enjoy your smoking. Change to Chesterfield today. Much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. Eight twelve p.m. Herman Stone returned to the hotel. Frank and I talked to him for about an hour. He appeared quite shaken when we told him of his father's death. We questioned him about the money that he'd suddenly come up with. He explained that he'd won it at the races. He gave us the name of the man who accompanied him to the track. Frank and I checked with him and found that Stone's story was true. We checked his shoe size and found that it was not the same as the print found at the scene of the murder. 10.46 p.m. We called the office and they told us that we'd gotten a message from the county hospital. Mrs. Stone was able to talk. She wasn't completely out of danger, but barring a relapse, she was expected to recover. Frank and I drove out to the hospital and talked to her. I wish I could help you more than I have, but there just isn't anything else. Well, could you give us any idea of about how tall they were? Well, that'd be pretty hard to do, Mr. Friday. I was lying down when they came into my room. I could only guess, but I'd say maybe as tall as you. I don't think much taller. I see. Now, how about their build, ma'am? Was it heavy or slight? I can't be sure. I guess if I must say one or the other, I have to say they're about medium. One was very strong, though. Ma'am? The one that carried me to the closet. He was strong. Just lifted me out of bed and carried me over to the closet and threw me on the floor. Did your husband have any large amounts of money in the house? Yes. Yes, he did. Herman never believed in banks, not since the crash. He always said that he could take care of the money as well as they could. Yes, ma'am. He had all of his savings in the house, kept them in the mattress on, on his bed. Do you know about how much that might be, Mrs. Stone? I'd only be guessing, but I'd say maybe twelve or $13,000. Herman didn't discuss finances with me. He always thought it was a man's business, and that I shouldn't have to worry about it. I tried to tell him, 
tried all the time. What's that, ma'am? That he should put the money in a bank. He used to talk about it, too. I know that didn't help any. Well, who did he talk to, Mrs. Stone? People in the neighborhood. He used to tell them that he didn't get the interest, but that he always knew just where his money was. He used to ask them if they could say the same. Mm-hmm. Can you think of anybody in the neighborhood who might do a thing like this? Oh, no. We've lived there for a long time. No, none of them would even think about it. I see. Did you or your husband have any enemies? Anyone that you had any arguments with, maybe? No, there wasn't anyone. Mr. Friday? Yes, ma'am? Does my son know about this? Does he know that his father is... Does he know about it? Yes, ma'am, he does. He's outside in the hall right now. He said he'd like to see you. Poor boy. Never did get along with his father. I tried to make them understand each other. I tried so hard, didn't seem to do any good. Mm-hmm. Well, if there's nothing else that you can tell us, ma'am. There's one thing. I hate to mention it, it seems so silly. What's that, Mrs. Stone? Well, when they were arguing with Herman in the next room, they got very loud. I thought that I recognized one of the voices, and I can't be sure, but at the time, I thought it. Yes, ma'am. Then when they came into my room, I was pretty sure. But I could be wrong, and I... Well, I wouldn't want to cause anybody any trouble. I wouldn't want to make a mistake. Well, who do you think it might have been? Whose voice do you think it was? It sounded like Smokey's. Who? Smokey. He used to do some work around the yard for Herman. That was a year or so ago. I haven't seen him since then. Well, do you know where we can get in touch with him, ma'am? No, I don't. As I said, I haven't seen him in over a year. What's his full name, Mrs. Stone? I don't know. But that, that's why I thought it might be a little silly. I don't even know his right name. He just told us his name was Smokey. A young man always had a cigarette in his mouth. Chain smoker, I think you'd call. Uh-huh. Herman used to kid him about it, you know, smoking all the time. I don't think Smokey liked it. He was a pretty serious young man. He used to get a little angry at Herman. I see. Can you give us a description of the man? Oh, yes. Nice-looking boy. I hope I haven't made a mistake. I hope I haven't done the wrong thing. Well, don't you worry about it, Miss Stone. What? That's his worry now. We continued to talk to Mrs. Stone. We got the description of the handyman who'd worked for her husband. 11.28 p.m. We went back to the city hall and ran the name and description through the moniker files in R&I. We came up with one good possible... In checking his record, we found that his full name was Charles P. Roxford. His age was listed as 37 years. The rest of his description matched the one we'd gotten from Mrs. Stone. He had an arrest record listing several charges of forgery, and at that time there was an outstanding warrant on him for check passing. We went back to the office and called forgery division. Yeah, Roxford. Yeah, that's right, Charles R. Huh? Well, we want to talk to him about a killing out on Brighton. Yeah. What? When was that? Yeah. Okay, we'll be right there. Well, that's a break. What do you mean? They know where he is? They got him. Charles Roxford had been picked up a few minutes before by officers in forgery division while he was trying to pass a bad check. Frank and I went down the hall and took the prisoner to the interrogation room. We talked to him for two hours. During that time, he'd admit nothing except his name and that he'd been trying to pass a phony check. Now you're off your rocker, and you know it. You got me for one thing, hanging paper. That's it, and you can't make anything more out of it. How about this money we found on you? Yeah, how about it? Where'd it come from? I won it. Where? In a crap game. Where was the game? I forgot. It was a floating game. Moved around a lot. You worked for the Stone family a year or so ago? Mm, I don't know. I might have. I worked for a lot of people. You worked for them? I might have, like I said. They seem to think you did. All right, so I did. What's that mean? You ever have any arguments with Stone? No, got along good. Never had no trouble. His wife thinks different. Oh, that's so? That's right. And she's off a rocket, too. Now, look, maybe you guys got all night, but I haven't. You aren't going anyplace. Well, how about booking me in? Let's talk in the morning, then, huh? All right, fine, Roxford, as soon as you answer a few more questions I for I told us. you all I know. Maybe you forgot something. Let's go over it again. What do you say? All right, all right. Where do you want to start? Well, can you tell us what you've been doing the last few days? Uh, any day in particular, or do you want to run down minute by minute? You just tell us what you've been doing, will you? Uh, let's see. Uh, this is Tuesday, isn't it? Yeah, it's Tuesday. All right, let's start with Monday. Is that all right with you? Come on, get on with it. Well, I got up yesterday morning about, uh, I think it was 11.30, lit a cigarette, got dressed, went downstairs and had some breakfast. Interesting? 
Go ahead. Oh, I can spice it up for you, you know, if you want. It's kind of dull when you tell a story. Well, you just tell a story, man. Oh, what are you guys trying to prove? What are you trying to tell? What'd you do last night? I had dinner and went to a show. Where'd you eat dinner? Place down on the spring. Did you eat alone? Yeah. What'd you do then? Like I said, I went to a show. Who went with you? Nobody. I, I didn't say anybody went with me. Oh, I must have thought you said that. Yeah. I went alone. All right. Where'd you go after that? I walked around, had a couple of drinks. Where? A bar down on Fifth. What time was that? About 12.30 or so. Anybody with you? No. You know the bartender? No, I never went in a place before. Then you got no way of proving you were there, isn't No, it? do I have to? Did it help? Well, why? I'm a big boy now. I don't have to explain anything to you guys. Now, get off my back, will you? I'm getting sick of playing footsie Where'd you, you go after you left that bar? I went home. Where's that? It's a place over on 4th. What time did you get in? I don't know. Maybe 1.30, 2. Mm-hmm. Desk clerk see you come in? No, he's asleep. How long ago did you say you worked for the stone? I didn't. You said I worked for him a year ago. Is that right? I guess so. I forgot. What, what's this bit about the stones? You got any way of proving where you were last night? Like I said, I don't have to. That's the way you look at it, mister. You're in trouble if you can't come up with an alibi we can't break. That right? Yep. Why? Because Mrs. Stone got a good look at you. She couldn't have. The lights were out. Yeah, no, that's clever, Roxford. Do you want to tell us about it now? Come on, Roxford. <laughs> All right, I should have known. I should have known. I never should have done it, but I didn't have any choice. You, you, you can't figure that, can you? What do you mean? Well, I, I owed this money. The guys are getting tired of waiting. They said I had to come up with it. I, I didn't have any choice. Is that right? Sure. Well, you can see it, can't you? I had to come up with the money. I tried to win it back. The more I played, the more I owed him. There just wasn't any other way. I knew old man Stone had it. Wasn't doing him any good, and I needed it, and I knew where he kept the money. Who was with you? Jackie Forbes. You know where we can find him? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. All right, you want to get the stenographer, Frank? Yeah. I should have known. Should have known, but there just wasn't any choice. There wasn't any other way. Well, why'd you kill him? He knew who I was. There's no choice. I had to. Is that right? Well, sure. You can see that yourself, can't you? I, I couldn't find any other way. You didn't look very hard, did you? The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 10th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, as I've told you before, Chesterfield is the first cigarette to give you premium quality throughout in both regular and king size. And Chesterfield is the cigarette that gives you this scientific report. No adverse effects to the nose and throat of a group smoking only Chesterfields. Now, as a two-pack-a-day Chesterfield smoker, I know it's the cigarette that's best for me. They really are much milder, and I'm sure when you try them, regular or king size, you'll agree Chesterfield is best for you. Charles Richard Roxford and Jack Allen Forbes were tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. They were executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Stacy Harris. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator on NBC.